Hi everyone, it's Josh with Talk About Trek, and we are back today, finally again, talking about a Star Trek book. Because I've just finished up today, Star Trek Titan, Over a Torrent Sea, by Christopher L. Bennett. Now this is the second Titan novel by Christopher L. Bennett. Uh, the first one was Orion's Hounds, which I enjoyed very much. Had some very cool concepts in it, so uh, I was looking forward to this. Uh, as always, the, the new procedure going forward is I don't read the back cover. So let's read it together now and find out what this book is all about. <clears throat> as the Federation recovers from the devastating events of Star Trek Destiny... <clears throat> oh, stop there. Uh, Star Trek Destiny was a three-part trilogy by David Mack. Uh, if you haven't read that, you definitely should read that. Uh, it's huge. It's big. It like kind of shatters the Star Trek world. In the book world, you know, and it's just a really fun, a fun trilogy with a lot of characters, you know, spanning over a lot of, a lot of different crews. So, we'll continue. <clears throat> Captain William Riker and the crew of the USS Titan are ordered to resume their deep space assignment, reaffirming Starfleet's core principles of peaceful exploration. But even far from home, on a mission of hope, the scars of the recent cataclysm remain with them as they slowly rebuild their lives. The planet Droplet is a world made mostly of water, without a speck of solid ground. Life should not exist here, yet it thrives. Ailey Lavina, Titan's aquatic navigator, spearheads the exploration of this mysterious world, facing the dangers of the vast, wild ocean. When one native species proves to be sentient, Lavina finds herself immersed in a delicate contact situation, and Riker is called away from Deanna Troy at a critical moment in their marriage. But when good intentions bring calamity, Lavina and Riker are cut off from the crew and feared lost. Troy must face a life-changing event without her husband, while the crew must brave the crushing pressures of the deep to undo the global chaos that they have triggered. Stranded with her injured captain, Lavina must win the trust of the beings who control their fate. But the price for Riker's survival may be the loss of everything he holds dear. So yeah, actually that covers the plot pretty well. And really too well, uh, again, in my opinion, you know. You, you really wouldn't want to know about these things going into the book because it spoils a lot of the fun. So, yeah, don't read the back cover. I mean, unless you just absolutely have to. If you have to, do it. Uh, if you don't, then just don't because it's going to spoil it for you. But anyway, this book, as I said, uh, it picks up after the Star Trek Destiny. Uh, the Federation is basically in recovery mode and they've decided to send the Titan out on a mission of exploration yet again. A kind of a way to give people, you know, like a sense of peace, maybe a sense of hope going forward after the devastating events that happened then. Uh, so the prologue is kind of set there where they're, they're setting out on this new mission, and they do discover a very interesting planet. So the planet is called Droplet, and it's a planet of entirely water. So there is absolutely no landmass, no... Um, basically nothing at all on the surface uh, until they get a little bit closer and they discover that there are islands, but the islands are actually made up of like living creatures. So like these living floating islands. So the book starts out great that way where you're basically getting this exploration mission. You're getting to explore a very different, very alien planet where things have had to evolve in a totally and completely different way. And um, as the back cover kind of stated, the book does feature Ailey Lavina, who is a Selkie, or a Pacifican. So basically, she, uh, her species lives underwater full time, so when she's on duty on the Titan, she has to wear a specific hydration suit to keep her gills wet and all that. So um, I think she's the one that's pictured here on the cover, of course. So um, she's never been on any TV show or any like anything like that, so... Uh, you just kind of have to go with your imagination and what the artist here has uh, put in. So, she's uh, the one who is the most familiar with the water, so she kind of takes the lead in the exploration and is the first one to contact and discover uh, what they dub the squales. And the squales are this species, um, seemingly very intelligent, kind of a cross between a squid and a whale. Maybe not quite so big, but uh, they have tentacles in the front and like a large whale-like body and, and appear to be intelligent and at one point even save her when she's being attacked by a larger predator there. So 
uh, one of the things this book does really well in the beginning, I would say, is just all like the fun science that, that you're getting out of it. Because the first, basically the first six chapters here of this book is just the Titan going to the planet, uh, discovering these creatures, discovering the other life forms, the other creatures on the planet. And from what it looks like is the other life forms and creatures on the planet have almost been bioengineered to serve a specific purpose for these squales. So now they've run into the problem of, is this a first contact situation? And have they violated the prime directive already by contacting these squales? So that's kind of where they're at now. So they do send Ailey down to to make contact and kind of discover, you know, are they sentient? Are they, you know, how much have they violated the, the prime directive? So she, she goes down and uh, success, but she does find out that they are very much sentient and they do actually, uh, they're very intelligent and they've actually learned how to breed the life on this planet into basically their tools because on this planet of course there's no metal there's nothing like that so everything that they've developed has had to develop out of a living organism so uh, for instance one of the things that they have is these inflatable gas bag jellyfish things that they fly up and use for like weather balloons and in the water of course they have uh, other creatures that they've developed to you know help feed them help you know, do other things, you know, to make up their very intricate and what uh, Ailey discovers is a very deep society. And definitely, I mean, as deep as what, what the Federation is. So now they do have a problem on their hand. Uh, these creatures or these, these squales are very much threatened by anything technological because to them it is completely different. Uh, nothing like that exists on their world at all. So it just it feels so wrong to them. Um, and that's why they're able to speak with her, but anyone else is kind of uh, unable to really approach them. So now we're getting about halfway through the book and we're hit with the big dilemma. <laughs> and it's kind of funny how it starts too. Uh, they're, while the away team is down doing their science there, the, uh, <clears throat> the rest of the crew is kind of examining this system. The system is a bit volatile. It has more asteroids than usual in it. And they have detected one that is going to come, come within a proximity and possibly may hit the planet. Uh, so they got a couple options. They can just monitor it at this point. And then one, one of the members of the uh, the crew on the bridge, and I forget the name of the guy, but he speaks up and says something like, well, we could go and divert it now. And if we do, it would take a lot less energy and time. Uh, but then uh, everyone just agrees. Well, we'll just wait until it gets a little bit closer, and then we have to move it. We have to move it. They should have listened to that guy <laughs> in his first suggestion. I will say so. Uh, that's the trouble. They do detect an asteroid coming. Uh, now, for the whole beginning of this book, uh, Captain Riker and Counselor Troy or Commander Troy have sat this one out. Uh, she is very much pregnant, very close to giving birth, uh, and Commander Riker or Captain Riker is just trying to stay close to her. Uh, so he's not participated in the mission, even though he's been wanting to go down there. Uh, but at this point, he's, his presence is requested. Uh, basically, they think that because of his kind of skill as a musician, he'll be able to uh, talk better or uh, communicate better with these squales uh, who, who speak through music, you know, as whales do. Talking with my hands a lot. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're about halfway through the book here. And, and this is where things go really terribly bad <laughs> for the crew of the Titan. Uh, in a simple matter, they want to attempt to kind of push the asteroid off course with their uh, their tractor beam. Everything goes wrong. So when they attempt to push it, uh, they get an enormous feedback that hits them. Consoles exploding everywhere. Uh, power down throughout the entire ship. It turns out that whatever this thing was made up made of was able to concentrate and then turn back the energy back to them. So their ship is down, kind of dead in space right now, and it's going to take some time to get it repaired. They go to uh, basically all of their shuttlecraft now. Those are still operable, so they can get those, use those to try to do something to move the asteroid. Still nothing. So they figure, okay, 
we can't move it. Maybe we can break it up into pieces with our phasers. <laughs> so they try to do that. They try to shoot it with the phasers. They try to blow it up with a warp core. Uh, lots of stuff happens. They do eventually get it into three separate pieces, but now they have just three pieces that are going to hit the planet. So uh, it didn't work out too well uh, for the, the crew of the Titan there. So uh, on the planet, things are going uh, not too great for like the communication between them. Uh, they find they're just kind of two different, uh, two different of people with them not having any technology at all. And, uh, you know, of course, the Federation relying so much on what they have. So, but then that's when things get really bad. <laughs> Once the asteroid actually hits the water, uh, the squales kind of think, well, you guys did this to us. So they turn their back on them. Uh, Riker and Ailey are caught in uh, like a big tidal wave and then are eventually um, blown over on their ship and uh, kind of black out, and they don't know what happens. Uh, the rest of the crew is, uh, they also get kind of uh, separated, but they all eventually manage to get back together on the Titan, all the ground crew and everything, and the only two missing are Riker and Ailey, who, it turns out, were rescued by the Squales, were saved by them, kind of brought back to life after they were injured, and now are, like, stranded on a desert island. So uh, the book kind of takes some weird turns at this point. <laughs> An especially weird turn when uh, uh, the so Deanna is getting ready to go into labor, and uh, because of some pent up emotional issues and some um, weird betazoid projection and some weird uh, I really need to do this right here. So in the back of this book here, they are nice enough to provide an appendix. So that when you forget all the names and species of this incredibly diverse crew, you can look it up here on your video. So the doctor, the chief medical officer of the Titan, in case you don't know, is a Apaquathan male. Now a Apaquathan male is basically, in my mind, what I picture as a, a Velociraptor. So, so they have a Velociraptor uh, for their doctor, and his name is uh, Shenti Yassi Eris Re. But they just call him Dr. Re for short. So Dr. Ree, for whatever reason, loses his head, uh, throws Deanna over his shoulder, and runs to the nearest shuttlecraft, and just gets the heck out of the ship, and, and takes off and land on a planet. Basically saying that he has to keep her safe, and her being here on the ship with all the things that are going on um, isn't going to work. And he's like unreachable. He's like got one goal, he's going to get her off the ship. So that was a little weird. It felt like the book kind of took like a, a very strange turn. And I'm wondering if they just kind of needed something in there maybe to give a little bit more action to what was a very science-heavy book, which I was happy with. It was fine. Uh, but it takes this little weird turn where he kidnaps her, basically, to Vak, who is working through his own issues here. Uh, he is kind of tasked with going after them and bringing them back. Uh, Re takes him to this planet, uh, an uncontacted planet that does not have space travel, so another prime directive <laughs> um, issue here, and, and basically lands and takes her to a hospital there on that planet uh, to keep her safe and uh, help her give birth. So that's what's happening there. Uh, down on Droplet, you have Captain Riker and Ailey who are kind of uh, trapped on this little desert island. Uh, they are unable to live on this planet because it just doesn't have the nutrients that they need. So they are slowly dying, and Riker, because he's not a, a water-going being, is uh, having a lot more trouble than her. So she's, he, she, he's kind of fading fast. Uh, there's some stuff going on between them where apparently they had a fling in the past. Uh, they have a little bit of a fight about that, and uh, things get a little bit weird, too. And uh, again, it's a, kind of the book took a little bit of a turn there, I kind of thought, but it wasn't too weird, and it did kind of expand upon her character, which was cool, and then it kind of turned it around in the end, too, where you were thinking maybe she was going to go one way, and then she went another way. So, uh, in the end, uh, science saves the day. Uh, the crew of the Titan, once they get all their ship stuff restored, are able to deduce what is going wrong, and basically what happened is all of their interference in this, all of their... Um, attempts to move and attempts to blow up this thing have only 
created like a discordance within this planet's magnetic field, which is like the, the song that these squales and everything on this planet kind of follow and live by. So everything has been screwed up thanks to the Titan's interference, but they can fix it through a series of probes. Many, many, many probes that they're going to drop down in there and kind of set everything straight. Um, so they're able to communicate with the squales, communicate uh, what's going on and kind of what they did and what they would like to do. They're initially... Uh, they, they don't want to do it. They, they think that basically the, the Federation, the Titan, caused all this trouble, which they did, and that their actions now would only make things worse. But uh, in the end, Ailey is able to convince them through a, like a very rousing song that she sings uh, that what they're doing is the right thing to do, and then all the squales join in on the song, and everybody's singing along, and uh, it's a happy ending for everybody. Uh, an actual kind of... Uh, so like I said, it takes a little bit of a weird turn there, uh, but it is very cool because in the end it is science that saves the day. It's a book that doesn't have an antagonist. Uh, basically the, the crew of the Titan is their own antagonist. They cause <laughs> all their own problems there. Uh, the whole situation with uh, Dr. Reed kidnapping Troy is a little weird, but it does come to a, a I guess a satisfying and kind of a fun conclusion uh, where she is able to successfully give birth after basically she just yells at him and <laughs> kind of dresses him down because uh, she has some like past issues with him that she was still working out and he has issues that he was still working out and Tuvok he has issues that he's still working out and uh, she does some yelling and they're able to work through a lot of issues together. Tuvok is nice enough to actually record some baby pictures for, for Captain Riker uh, which I thought was kind of cute there in the end. Uh, so Pretty good. Pretty good, all in all. Um, I kind of wish they'd maybe just... There was a lot of science. And maybe I can see why they were like, okay, you know, you can't take another three chapters to talk about these aquatic creatures. So let's, let's move on. Let's get something going. Maybe someone suggested that. But um, all in all, I mean, it was a really fun ride. So uh, I would definitely recommend Over a Torrent Sea. I would recommend every Star Trek book that I read because that's just what I do. I read Star Trek books and then I recommend for you all to read the Star Trek books as well because they are fun to read and especially this one is. And I've actually had a good time with this. Uh, the Titan books, I initially started, I think back when I started keeping this notebook here, which was back in July of 2020. And I had read the first four Titan books then, before jumping into Test uh, Destiny and some other things after that. And I think I am going to continue on and do another maybe one or two Titan books before we switch it up and do something different. So uh, definitely looking forward to that. Uh, the Crew of the Titan is very fun. It would have made such a good cartoon. It could make such a good cartoon just because of the, the wide diversity of the crew and getting to see all these different even in some cases almost like non-humanoid you know crew members that they have going on here uh, that just would be awesome to see in animated form so we did get to see a little bit of the titan of course on lower decks but uh, there weren't as many uh, non-human crew members as i was hoping to see uh, there actually so well i think that's all we're going to have to say about over torrent c tonight uh, but we will be back very soon to talk about lots more lovely Star Trek things. So as always, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Live long and prosper, and we will see you all in the next one.